En uh, tegenwoordig is uh, Emiel uh, werkzaam bij de Ryan NCC als uh, wetenschapper. Hij doet als taak om uh, ja, de boel helemaal <laughs> zelf te meten. En uh, ja, ik uh, doe zelf ook met hoe wat uh, metingen. En, uh, uh, ik gebruik er voor ruimte atlas. En als ik uh, wat meer resources uh, nodig heb, dan uh, neem ik wel eens contact op met mijn. Uh, <laughs> measurement maatje en nieuw. En, uh, maar de laatste tijd uh, loopt dat wat minder uh, soepeltjes. Vanwege uh, een incidentje. Uh, hè, dat, uh, ja, is goed. Maar uh, ja, en nieuw uh, heeft het dus de afgelopen uh, ja, weken heel druk gehad met het uh, analyseren van de consequentie van uh, de inval in uh, Oekraïne. En, uh, ja, ik ben heel, heel benieuwd wat je allemaal hebt gevonden. Ja. Dus, de vloer is jongens. Ja, dankjewel. Uh, uh, ik wil mijn presentatie graag in het Engels doen, omdat ik, ik droom hierover in het Engels. Uh, dus uh, het, 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 ik ga heel erg stotteren als ik het in, allemaal naar het Nederlands moet vertalen. Dus, uh, maar ik zal, ik zal mijn intro in het Nederlands doen. Dus ik ben nu heel uh, opgeraamd. Uh, uh, dus mijn Nederlands is met een Brabants accent en mijn Engels is met een Nederlands accent. Uh, en uh, ja, ik uh, doe internetmetingen bij de Wijkman CC, dus een van de vijf re uh, regional internet registries. Dus al, uh, alle IP-adressen die worden via ons uh, verdeeld, via de vijf uh, RIR's. En als onderdeel daarvan hebben wij ook een uh, research afdeling en daar doen wij uh, metingen met internet. De twee platformen, Wijk Atlas. En uh, wij RIS. En uh, ik kan niet in al te veel detail, in detail in op die platform, maar ik heb wat uh, links uh, als mensen het interessant vinden. En uh, natuurlijk ook uh, uh, als, je, als je het leuk vindt om met deze, dit soort data uh, te pielen, dan dat is een chat. En toen ging ik over naar het Engels. Dus dit is een presentation about the internet in, in, in Ukraine. Um, and I don't know how your lives have been over the past couple of weeks. Uh, um, what I've done, done a lot is just look at uh, news on the internet about Ukraine, uh, what was happening there, uh, and also in a, in a professional uh, capacity, I look at the structure of the internet. Uh, so I'm, I'm naturally all, uh, looking at all the data every morning, what has happened now. And that's what this presentation is uh, is about. Um, and of course, uh, unless you live under a rock, you know uh, Russia invaded Ukraine, 24 February 2022, uh, and that's why, uh, yeah, this did, um, and that has. Well, we were just recovering from a pandemic, and then uh, the world was shocked by uh, by, by this event. Um, And a lot of people expected uh, Russia to just knock out the internet in, uh, in Ukraine, and it didn't happen. And it didn't happen, it didn't happen, it didn't happen, and what? Um, why did this happen? And there's, there's a couple of theories about that. Some say uh, the Russian army needs this internet. Uh, some other theories. Um, But when I started looking at, at, at the, the internet there, there's a couple of really interesting things uh, that I'd like to share uh, about why this internet might be more resilient than you think. And I hope there's some lessons in there for, uh, also for software development. Um, uh, and looking at this with uh, open data and open, uh, open tools, I have lots of uh, links to source code and, uh, and, and stuff like that in, in the presentation. Um, What basically summarizes um, the, the situation uh, about the internet in Ukraine best is, is this picture. There's a couple of these types of pictures of um, a network engineer splicing fiber amidst of uh, um, yeah, a war zone and uh, um, horrible conditions. But this is like maybe. The, the most important aspect is the non-technical aspect is the people, the Ukrainian people, really want this stuff to work. So, uh, and that uh, they go above and beyond to actually make it work. Um, yeah, 
I sent lots of links. I will share the presentation afterwards. I guess you can put it up on the uh, 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 open website uh, so people can look at this. Um, so the elements of resiliency that we found for specifically for the Ukrainian internet is, of course, I, I told you about the, the, the humans, the dedication, courage, perseverance. Um, another more technical aspect is uh, ISP decentralization. So there's not a lot of big players in the world, which means there's not a lot of like single things you can attack um, to, to disrupt. Um, there's diverse interconnections. They have a lot of IXPs, internet exchange points. Um, so that's, uh, I guess people are familiar with exchange points. Um, uh, and another aspect is high uh, independence uh, at a tran transit network level. I mean, the IHR is a, uh, is a, a project I work on with a, a, a fellow researcher at the IIJ Institute in Japan. And it's the Internet Health Report. And you just have a, a bunch of uh, internet analysis things there. Um, and what you can see there is that um, the, the, the networks that Ukraine depends on, and that's a highly diverse set, uh, which of course helps. And Another thing is uh, the, the actual physical fiber um, is also very diverse, and like in, in, in all of these levels you see resilience, like multiple levels. Uh, there's uh, a blog entry for telegeography that tells you a little bit about uh, these fibers. Um, so I'm going to dive a little bit into the, 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 the details here, the decentralization in uh, UA, Ukraine. Um, what you see here is a, is a visualization of um, uh, actually a, a, a now a colleague of, uh, of Willem uh, who helped me make this visualization. And what you actually see here is a is, is this other ring. It's, it's, it's supposed to be a full ring, um, and that is market shares of individual ISPs. And well, they have weird names. This is a Kiev Star. This is Ukraine Telecom. Triolan is, 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 is a uh, known. This is the research and education network. Uh, yet, no. Uh, yes. This is the CERFNET equivalent. Um, uh, and this is uh, data we get from our fellow um, uh, RAR APNIC. And they have market shares per uh, network per ISP. Um, and if you do like a in, in economics, you have this uh, HHI. I, I, I can never uh, uh, remember the names of the inventors, so it's just if you look for HHI, you will find it. And it's, e economics is it's an indicator of market concentration, and uh, zero means uh, it's like super dispersed, like uh, you have lots of small parties that, that consist of the market, and the one is a monopoly. And if you just uh, calculate these numbers for all of the, uh, the ISPs in all of the individual countries, Ukraine is fourth more, most dispersed in the world. Um, US, Brazil, and Russia uh, are even more dispersed. Um, um, and what you actually see in this visualization, um, well, we didn't uh, add the, the less than 1% of market ISP. So you can see like 55% of the, the end user market is uh, for small uh, organizations with less than 1% of the market. So um, so that's not the not visualized part. And what we actually do here is use uh, RIP Atlas, which is like small measurement devices to do trace route between them. And you can actually see what's in between these networks. So what's in between the users, and you see a lot of, uh, these are IXPs in orange, and a lot of other networks. So there's there's uh, diversity here. That's, uh, that's basically what the, uh, what the visualization shows. Uh, next one is IXP abundance. Um, there's a database, uh, PeeringDB, where ISPs and IXPs uh, <laughs> register. Um, if you want uh, others to use your services or if you want to interconnect, uh, there's a staggering 19 IXPs in PeeringDB that are in Ukraine, and we can actually see 13 of them in right Atlas measurements that we do. Um, and this is like uh, every row and every column is a right atlas probe, and 
this is basically a first row to a second, uh, well, rows and columns are the same entities, so, and every cell basically is an IXP if it was if it was found on the path. So lots of this is mediated by XPs. Here we don't see IXPs. Um, but the other thing is um, there's a lot of different colors here, meaning a lot of different IXPs are being used. So there's not a single one very dominant again. Um, uh, under the sea. Um, and uh, we do this um, oh, there's, there's a URL here we call this the IXP Country Jedi. Jedi because my kids like Star Wars. Um, um, and, and that's an open source software. So this is a point to uh, uh, briefly uh, go out and how, how, how do you actually do this. Um, we look at, uh, we use Atlas, which is a measurement platform with 11,000 something devices right now. Um, that's the version two and three. That's uh, anchors. We have various uh, measurement devices, and if you're part of this platform by either hosting one of, of these devices, or uh, like Willem does, he asks me, "I have this really cool research project that is for the good of the internet. Can we do this measurement?" And we usually say yes. Um, we have these really cute version one probes, um, but yeah, they, they're a bit uh, not powerful enough. And you do basically do pings, trace routes, um, and uh, a prototype I built uh, on top of that is this IXP Country Jedi. It's on GitHub. It does mesh trace routes. So for a given, typically we, I do this for a country. For a given country, you take all of the networks, so uh, identified by uh, their own XM, on the system number. You pick one or two probes and you just do a mesh between them. And you can see all kinds of uh, funny things like uh, tromboning, uh, out of the country, um, and well, that's just like a, a piece of software, like five uh, crappy scripts, uh, you run it on your own laptop, so. Um, and um, it analyzes these results, visualizes them, and that's actually the, this picture that you saw last is just one of these custom runs that we uh, do. We do this every month, uh, these runs, so. Uh, if you go to the latest, you'll actually see uh, the one that I showed you was from uh, March. Now there will be a, a May version, but it pretty much looks the same. Uh, I, I looked this morning. Um, so another cool thing that you can do with this Ripe Atlas is um, these are devices that uh, they uh, make connections to our control infrastructure. Um, uh, we send them, hey, you should do a trace route to uh, MPLS X or a ping to this, or, and you get results back from you. So we have like a, if you call it like a, a the controllers, the measurement infrastructure reports back there. And we also keep track of when these probes connect or disconnect. So with that, you can actually create a, a very dumb, uh, uh, is this part of the internet online or not type of uh, detector. So, uh, when we look, for instance, for this uh, this one ISP, Sviolan, yeah, this is a yes number, 2% of the market, uh, they were hacked on uh, 24 uh, February. Uh, so it's not that the, the Russians didn't try, uh, they actually hacked this network, uh, which was uh, uh, described on the, uh, the website of Sviolan. And we can actually see uh, we had 11, 11 probes uh, uh, in Sviolan and then all of a sudden we had uh, at this point three. So, um, uh, th so this is the, the, the aggregate of all the probes that are online, and this is the individual timelines for the probes, and you can actually see here, there's a really straight line. Uh, this also has the AS numbers and uh, probe ID, so you can actually get more information about locations and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, Um, I, um, the difference is, um, <coughs> huh? No, 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 no. The, uh, I, I see a uh, a slight bug because uh, it's supposed to uh, color by uh, ASN, and sometimes you have uh, like one uh, the ASN for IPv4 and IPv6 can be different, and actually uh, for this one. Uh, no, no, because this one is 
V6, and these ones are the V4, and it's not a problem. It's just me reading uh, things about it. Um, so that's, uh, but let's see, did I, um, I, I can get back to that. Um, there's other people uh, looking at this type of stuff. So um, a former colleague of mine, Alberto <coughs> Donati uh, from Keda, uh, developed uh, this uh, interface, IOTA, which is really interesting. Like you can just put a country in, and it has uh, a couple of um, um, network indicators, like uh, background radiation uh, from scanning. Uh, it's actually a useful thing to figure out if a country is online or not. <coughs> you can look at uh, BGP, I'll, I'll get into BGP a little bit later, if address space is actually routed or not, and you also have an active probing uh, that they do all, all the time. Um, so you can actually see uh, some signals there, um, and more and more of the big content providers like Cloudflare, uh, Google Transparency has uh, uh, some data. Uh, they provide these graphs of, um, and in the Cloudflare radar, case, they actually have um, per AS, per network, uh, traffic graphs, which is, which is pretty cool. And you can actually see there, uh, so this was uh, when the evasion started in uh, Ukraine, that uh, there was a shift towards, um, see here the lines mostly overlap, and here uh, again, there's a gap, uh, which is because a lot of people were on the move and were using all that. Um, what we see in, in my Atlas actually is, uh, 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 this is Ukraine, uh, 220, 225 probes online, and it slowly deteriorates. Like there was a, a, a drop in the beginning, and slowly it deteriorates, slowly goes down. Um, and it's, at this point, it's, it's still unsure um, what caused that, that decline. My uh, theory is that it's mostly caused by people fleeing. Um, if you think of, uh, there's a couple of million people on the, uh, uh, have left their houses right now in a population of 44 million. And this is about this, um, I could totally imagine that people would shut down the electricity of their houses so these devices will not be online. And there won't be internet there. Um, so now, demonstration. <laughs> Let's see if this works. Um, so this is the, the live interface for this, and uh, I, can, I can show more on <coughs> For instance, um, let's see, do people have like a network or uh, something? I, I can just use the new brain. Uh, so this is what the interface looks like. If you go here, you can do all your own network. You can do like 50 kilometers around Amsterdam or Utrecht or whatever. Um, the interface is still a bit slow, so if you're uh, totally into JavaScript, uh, this actually is a really cool uh, platform. It's called Observable HQ, which does like. Um, let me go to the... See here, you have. Uh, yeah, so there was something going on here in, in Ukraine, in like a, 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 a brief dinner in uh, in, in pro connectivity. Uh, so these, some of these small devices went down, uh, and what amazes me actually is uh, how, if you see these types of outages how fast they, uh, things uh, start working again. Um, and here you see the individual uh, networks. So each network has a, each uh, autonomous system has a different color here. So that's, uh, uh, that's the meaning there. And this is totally like uh, all of these cells, if you know Python notebooks, this works roughly like Python notebooks. You basically have a data, data set somewhere uh, that, you, that you create and munch a little bit. And you can create these types of interactive visualizations. Um, really cool platform. Um, there's, there's the URL for that. Um, yeah, more pictures of uh, um, people splicing uh, fiber. Uh, uh, this is like an official uh, Ukrainian uh, government account and showing that basically uh, competitors actually uh, help each other in uh, just to keep this internet going. And that's also something like in uh, some of the hurricanes uh, that uh, got into the US, even in the US, the competitors start to help each other in 
by all times. <clears throat> this is a question I, I, I was asked a lot about, and I, I don't know the definite answer. Uh, what's the effect of Starlink? Because, uh, <coughs> but I know there's a lot of buzz uh, around uh, what's, uh, uh, what's been happening there. Um, my best guess, but uh, if there are people here uh, that are versed in satellite networks uh, or Starlink is specific, I would love to talk to you because uh, my best guess is uh, because this has limited bandwidth available and there's a limited amount of terminals being distributed, uh, it won't come close to even being able to replace uh, fiber capacity. But I've uh, also seen the document, uh, documentation for uh, disaster emergency situations where, for instance, Mario Ball, that's where the internet just broke down because no power, no internet, no fibers, no internet. Um, but apparently, if you just have a diesel generator that uh, gives you a little bit of power, you can, uh, and you can hook up uh, GSM-based stations to such a device and you can provide uh, connectivity for, I don't know how many people uh, you, can, you can get to a GSM tower, <coughs> But that's just enough to have everybody send messages to their loved ones saying, hey, I'm safe, or hey, I'm here, hey, I'm there. Same in uh, Bucha. Uh, they had two GSM base stations left uh, after the, the Russians left the city. Uh, these were connected also to the Starlink. So uh, these are like a really valuable cases. And uh, actually, this morning I read a thread about how it's super useful for military targeting, but that's also totally not my area of expertise. Um, and they're very resistant to uh, all kinds of uh, electronic warfare uh, interference of, of satellite signals, uh, apparently. Um, here's another, uh, what I think is, uh, this goes back a little bit, uh, well, it starts uh, last weekend. Um, <coughs> this is, I don't think this is really readable. My apologies for that. Um, what you can actually see here is um, uh, Kherson, which is a city right here. So roughly this part is occupied by, uh, by, by, by uh, Russia right now, uh, including Kherson. And um, what you can see here is um, data that indicates that uh, Kherson Telecom, the main telecom uh, network for, 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 for the city, uh, on May the 4th, went from uh, their usual upstreams, like uh, 1299, Gojek, these are big tier ones, big uh, transit providers, international, to uh, using um, um, Ross Telecom and Miranda Media. And these are very interesting networks, Ross Telecom is a, is a big Russian network. Um, and Miranda Media is uh, very special, uh, and I'll, I'll uh, show that in the uh, next slide, because that's uh, an organization that was uh, founded specifically to route traffic from Crimea to, uh, to Russia, via Russia to the wider internet. So this is where Kherson is, so that used to go probably up to Kiev and then to, uh, to Europe, or the US, or uh, other places on the internet, and now they're routing via uh, around the media, which, and there's a Kerch Strait, this is the Kerch Strait, and I put, put the arrow over. Um, they, they, um, there's uh, two cables there um, that the Russians put there next to the bridge, or on the bridge, under the bridge, um, and then riding, riding it on. Um, uh, so there's um, a rustification of the internet going on there. Um, this has moved back uh, over the last couple of days, so we don't know the backstory there. And that's also, um, this is the hard data that we have, and, and this is always, uh, there's the fog of war. We don't know what's actually going on there. Maybe we will know a couple months, a couple of years after. So, and uh, somebody actually uh, asked for that. Uh, well, hey, these large uh, ISPs should just filter any uh, Ukrainian network that goes via this type of app. Um, why I say like a couple of years later is because um, there is a case study of uh, an internet interregnum. Uh, uh, I work with very smart people, so I learn new words. I didn't know what an interregnum was. It's apparently a, a period of instability between two stable periods. Um, 
And what happened in the Crimea in 2014, Russia held a referendum and annexed uh, uh, Crimea. And I was working together with uh, Senia, who's a sociologist who did field interviews in, uh, in, in Crimea. She speaks Russian and Ukrainian, I think. Um, and Roman, who is uh, a network researcher. And um, but, uh, like on the network research side, what we brought to the table is a, a metric we call AS hegemony. So that's like how uh, dependent is one network on another network. So say I am 100% dependent on my ISP. Uh, and if that ISP is 100% dependent on an upstream, then I'm also 100% dependent on that upstream, right? So if there's two upstreams, then uh, I'm 50% dependent on, 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 on these upstreams. So this is basically what AS actually tells you. Um, so uh, you can get that per, if you know the AS number, you can actually get, um, this is the AS that the right MCC has. Um, you can basically see who is depending, or what your network is depending on. So um, not just your direct, uh, you directly connected, but also upstream of that. So, who does your ISP route via? Uh, and that depends on PGP data uh, using like this. This is our PGP data collection platform. PGP is the, the internet routing protocol. Uh, so, that's, I hope that explains this actually well enough. Um, so, we actually saw this. Um, so this shows uh, networks, and this. So uh, what the line here says is that um, the Ukrainian pop, uh, networks are uh, this dependent on uh, this network, uh, and well, the, the hegemony goes from uh, uh, light to, to black. So this basically is a control. Nothing, not a lot happened uh, 2012, 2018 for Ukraine. It's the same networks that uh, are they are dependent on. This is also control for Russia, nothing really significantly changed. But if you look for Crimea, um, these are the, the, the Crimean networks, uh, uh, Ukrainian networks. You basically see them being phased out. Um, this is um, Russian networks, and you see this Ross Telecom and Miranda Media, the year 2014. Um, they become more and more and more dominant until the end, where they're actually uh, basically uh, the choke point. Um, but there's a, a second pair, UMLC and Fjord, that actually go via a second cable there, so there's actually redundancy there. Um, and this, uh, well, this, it, 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 the dependence on US networks uh, decreases. You can actually see, but, and the interesting thing here is 2014 is when the, the, the change happened, and this took years to actually uh, change there. Um, What's also interesting from the field work is that uh, while there was lots of political pressure from both sides uh, on Ukrainian and Russian network operators, these people actually worked together. Uh, so it's actually, uh, uh, these people wanted this internet thing to just work, no matter what, uh, um, what, what the politicians wanted. Um, I'm a bit old. <coughs> Oh, sh shortly, this actually is a transition diagram, so here you can actually see uh, the most, these are the networks, and this is basically time a snapshot every month, and you can actually see it going from uh, Crimean networks being uh, dominant for the region to Russian networks being dominant, and the Ukrainian network being phased out. Uh, and especially at the end of the transition, you see Still some Crimean networks, still a little bit of Ukrainian networks, but in the end it's all Russian networks. So this had like a lot of changes to, but it takes three years. Uh, um, and um, well, the other interesting thing is it's a topological choke point uh, reflecting, in the end it reflects the geopolitics in the region, but now also, uh, with new occupied territory, this type of effect uh, might also start to happen. And um, uh, well, we saw first signs of this already. Um, yes? Why do you think it should work? Um, do you think there's knowledge? <laughs> no. 
Yeah. One, yeah. one of these four traffic goes to the other one. Okay, so you, you, you assume that you know, just disconnecting the cable to the old networks. I, I think it was like maybe active. Resistance to, to to changing like yeah. this works and this is the um, if you just look at it uh, geogra geographically uh, going probably going via Kiev uh, to Europe is shorter mm -hmm. less latency uh, pro maybe more bandwidth available uh, less likely to uh, there's all kinds of things uh, if you have to route around Ukraine um, it's, yeah, more latency uh, more chances of Things be happening. Um, on one, you get like uh, state censorship might be uh, let's put it uh, uh, neutrally. There might be state censorship in in, in one side and, uh, and and maybe also the other side. But it's, it's basically which 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 is pick your poison. That's that's the other thing. Um, this this is the last. Uh, um, the organization I, I worked for was asked to uh, revoke all the internet number of resources for Russian members by the, the, the uh, uh, Ukrainian Department of Communication, I think. Um, well, this caused a, a bit of a stir, of course. Um, and uh, we had a, a, a statement back that uh, yeah, this is basically not how the internet works. Because this is not uh, our mandate to do this. Uh, individual networks can, of course, filter whatever they want. They already do that in all kinds of uh, shapes and fashions. For instance, RPKI, which uh, is going to talk about. Um, and also, Dutch, it's not uh, according to Dutch law. Uh, it's, not, it's not the mandate. Um, but there is leniency towards members who cannot pay. Uh, and there's a URL for the, for the, for the actual statement. Um, but I think what more interesting is uh, some big networks, some tier ones, the, the big transit uh, networks, made some statements about sanctioning Russian networks. Um, I looked in our data, I didn't see this happen. <laughs> it's, uh, um, so it, I, I, uh, I cannot conclusively say nothing happened. Um, what you actually see, for instance, of Cogent and Lumen are the two who said uh, they, they did something. Uh, Cogent has not added any Russian networks uh, since uh, the invasion, and the other ones have, um, to, to, to their set of uh, adjacent ASs, to the adjacent networks. So, um, it's actually a vis visualization of, uh, so what does this inter uh, internet in Russia looks like? Look like um, red is the Russian networks, um, and I basically, uh, looked at all of the Russian networks, how that's interconnected, and also the like one step beyond. Uh, it's a song. <laughs> um, um, and and uh, that's all, all the, the blue. And I had a special color for the tier ones because they do the most transit. Uh, um, and I made the, the bubbles um, uh, be the hegemony values for these networks for end users. So. You can actually see this, this common names. Ross Telecom is very um, uh, hegemonious over, over, over users, but also uh, the, the international tier ones. Uh, but what struck me is there's just a lot of interconnection uh, between Russian networks and non-Russian networks. Um, and this is not a traffic graph. This is just like any uh, connectivity. For instance, if you peer at an exchange, it's typically not a lot of traffic, uh, but it will show here. So. Um, but yeah, it's a very complex network. Um, so maybe one network sanctioning might not have a lot, uh, a, a lot of effect. Um, what we did see, and this is again in the Internet Health Report, is latency changes. So Rap Atlas data um, before the invasion, flat meaning uh, basically latency is, 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 is stable. Here you see diurnal patterns. That typically means that at some point of the day, links might get saturated or they might be uh, competing with DDoSes or something. Uh, so we saw that for Ross Telecom and Trans Telecom, um, links, the uh, uh, London Internet Exchange uh, said, uh, we're gonna do something about it. We have to comply to sanctions. Um, we saw this with Bribe Atlas. This is the links uh, megaphone port and at some point on this date, 
it drops uh, and uh, traffic to other or path via other ports at the exchange uh, increased, but we also saw path via Amzix in Amsterdam, here in the Netherlands, and DKX in Germany. Um, and we also saw uh, other transit providers. This, these are all, um, or mostly, uh, Russian uh, transit providers. So for destinations in Russia, other transit providers just took over. Um, um, another thing, um, there's Russia, but there's also networks that depend on the Russian network. <laughs> uh, especially, um, oh, you have a question? Yeah. Um, Russia is very well connected, so uh, not not like China, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's they they do get unfilled or they have the possibility to get unfiltered internet. Or <laughs> that's a complex. They, they are heavily reg they have a cross. Uh, I, I forget they have a national regulator, and every ISP has to comply with the rules there. Uh, which basically sometimes it's uh, if you're above a certain size. Um, you have to put certain devices in your network. Uh, you have to comply to, like, okay, they say this is a sanction list here, implement it. I, I think it works roughly uh, that way. Don't pin me down on, on the details. But um, there is stuff going on. Uh, well, just like here in the Netherlands, we had a pirate bay filter, right? Uh, for some ISPs, uh, governments do this type of thing. Uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, so this is about other countries being affected by whatever happens in Russia. Uh, it, just doesn't, it doesn't just stay in Russia. Um, this is uh, Kyrgyzstan, and this is uh, again, the, the, uh, these are the Kyrgyz Kyr 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 uh, networks. Um, they actually depend quite heavily on Russian networks, and this is uh, Kazakhstan, Kazakh network. Um, so if something happens in Russia with sanctions, uh, there's a, a couple of uh, Central Asian countries that are also going to be affected. So, um, five minutes, that's time for conclusions. But first, a total aside. Um, language matters. I have a couple of Ukrainian colleagues who kept uh, bugging me, bugging me about that, uh, the fact that I said the Ukraine, and I called the city Kiev instead of Kiev. Or at least wrote it down. Um, for them, it was very important. I didn't understand what, what, what's this all about. Mm -hmm. But uh, I finally had the, the, the courage to ask. Because, yeah, I was like, these people are already heavily, uh, well, they have friends and family in the war zone. And some of them are actually still in the war zone. Um, but this is uh, the Ukraine, is the name of the territory when it was still part of, of the USSR. So for them, it's the language of the oppressor. So it really matters, uh, and there's an excellent Wikipedia article about this, explaining this. Um, Kiev and Kar Kharkov uh, are Russian names, and the, the, the Kiev, Kharkiv are Ukrainian names. So um, think about that if you write these down, or if you talk about this, if you can, if you, if you care. Um, but takeaways, um, what I started with, internet is very resilient there. Uh, I don't know how it happened, but it's redundant at a lot of layers. Uh, it's, it's almost like a, a, a good security uh, uh, thing going on. Um, but as any human-made system, it has breaking points. So it's uh, uh, given enough trust, pigs can fly. Um, so in this given enough uh, uh, um, destructive force, this will also uh, 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 yeah, break. But it, it can stand a lot. Um, and we observe this with data we collect. And like Atlas right this is very open, this data is freely available. So if you'd like to play with that type of data, uh, come talk with me, look at our website, look at my presentation, there's lots of links there. Um, so there's the Internet Health Report, that's uh, essentially the ISP Country Jedi Observable Notebooks, all open source, open to tinker with and to improve. Uh, what I want to finish with. Is this. If you care about the internet in Ukraine, uh, there's an organization called the Global Nog Alliance, and they are specifically uh, catering for helping the, I, uh, the ISPs in Ukraine. So they actually, uh, people can donate routers, switches, all kinds of uh, gear. 
uh, they just have a guy uh, who drives a truck to Ukraine and delivers this stuff. Uh, they now need, most need fiber splicers because that's the stuff that gets damaged most. So they actually have, uh, they're collecting money to buy fiber splicers, splicers for Ukraine. So, um, so if you care, please look at this website and see if you can help them. Um, I guess that's, that's it, time for questions. Yes. The resilience of the Ukraine network. Uh, you have the number HS, HSI, yes. which was 0 0.05. Yeah. What is it on the uh, I have it on my laptop. I don't know off the top of my head. So I can, I can, I can. Um, uh, wow. It's also not, it's not, not bad. Um, for instance, if you look at uh, another extreme, uh, Turkmenistan, which has basically one ISP, uh, and uh, Uruguay, I was also surprised. They have still have a, like a very uh, large state telco that has like 90% of the market. Um, but uh, um, I have the data in, it's on GitHub actually, the data. Uh, <laughs> <coughs> yeah, if, if you find me on GitHub, one of my repositories just has the code that I used to generate this, as well as the, I think I have a dump of the, the table a couple of weeks ago. So. Uh, well, yes. um, as I understand that the attack in 2014 by Russia on, on Ukraine, they were forced to change their army setup from that moment on, that was a wake up call, as I understand. Um, did something and the same will change their internet connectivity? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if it changed uh, because of that. What, what you see, for instance, the Donbass uh, had like a, this Russification going on already, but uh, the rest, I think, already uh, always has been. Uh, there's very, uh, there's a lot of small networks. Uh, there uh, might be a cultural thing. It's also we, we also see it in uh, in Romania and Bulgaria. So there's, there's like um, uh, and Russia has a lot of like small networks. For instance, the Shakhtar Donetsk is a, a, a soccer team uh, from Donetsk, which has moved to uh, to another place. But they have their own uh, uh, separate address space for for. It. So just to tell you, like little factories have their own. Uh, space and they're connected to one or two local providers and then maybe they switch to other providers uh, that's the way it's structured there so and I think that has always been uh, like that maybe they prepared a little bit but uh, yeah that, that, that was the base that they they, they, uh, they worked off of Thanks. Lunch, right? Yeah. <laughs>